So we've got two fantastic uh, participants today, um, and they, they have quite a lot of connections, um, both Cambridge University and Keio University, which we've been talking about. Um, so our chair this evening is Paul Madden, CMG, um, and he was the British ambassador to Japan uh, until earlier this year. Um, before that, he was uh, High Commissioner to Australia and to Singapore, so that's the equivalent of ambassador to both of those uh, countries. Um, and among other things, he was Managing Director at UK Trade and Investment, so long experience in the Foreign Office. Um, currently, he advises corporate clients, uh, speaks and writes, um, and he's giving a series of lectures as a visiting professor of international relations at Keio University. Which brings me to uh, Yuichi Hosoya, um, so he is Professor of International Politics at Keio University, um, but uh, luckily for us he's in the UK for one year uh, as a visiting fellow at Downing College, Cambridge. Um, I should have mentioned Paul was originally at Cambridge, so that's the Cambridge connection, and so was I actually. <laughs> um, and uh, Jose Asensei is Managing Director and Research Director at the Asia Pacific Initiative Tokyo. He's a Senior Researcher at the Nakasone Peace Institute senior fellow at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research and a senior adjunct fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Um, he has advised the uh, Japanese government uh, over many years on various subjects, um, including uh, issues to do with the security and defense in particular, and he has written uh, quite a few books. Uh, he is, I think, one of Japan's best known experts on international politics and international relations. So, I think we're going to start um, with a presentation from Hoso Yasuke. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jason, for your very kind introduction. And thank you very much for everyone to join this seminar. It's really nice to uh, return to this normal in-person meeting. And uh, I think that my talk is a kind of a rehearsal for a succeeding a good lectures. <laughs> and uh, well, I, uh, as, as I was introduced, I am now currently a visiting fellow at the Cambridge University. And it's really nice to meet so many friends and people here, uh, particularly focusing on the UK-Japan relations. Uh, well, after two years, I forget what I, I, I should talk of, what I should do in this kind of in-person meeting, because I'm quite familiar with Zoom meeting every day. I attend the Zoom meeting. Uh, so I usually watch screen. Sometimes I switch off the screen. <laughs> I sometimes write emails. Or I sometimes do otherwise. So, but today there are so many persons in this room. It's really nice to experience this kind of atmosphere after two years. Basically, I usually attend so many meetings all over the world, like South Africa, Azerbaijan, Russia, China, Korea, and so on. And of course, the UK as well. So, well, my, well my, 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 my best uh, 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 pleasure is to not just to meet people, but to experience towns and the atmosphere there in the country, in different countries. So uh, I'm really glad to be able to come to the UK after the COVID uh, restrictions. And today's topic is UK-Japan Security Cooperation. Of course, Ambassador Madden is the best person to explain that. So I can easily give my 20 minutes to him. <laughs> and maybe, well, he has so many things to, to talk about this. And also, uh, I think that we have uh, Professor Alessio Paterano. Alessio is here? Not yet? OK. Uh, he's the best expert on the topic. So maybe I can give him 20 minutes to, 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 to talk on this. Maybe he can talk two or three hours on this topic, more than that, perhaps. So uh, I was thinking what I should talk and what I could talk. And I think that I'm a historian. I'm teaching international history to Japanese students. So I tried today to place uh, the UK-Japan Security Cooperation. Now it's very strong, stronger, thanks to, of course, the efforts that uh, Ambassador Madden made in the last several years. The current security cooperation be between the two countries, Japan and the UK, are very strong. 
So I really like to place it in a much broader historical context or historical framework. And uh, my title is a bit confusing, from Afghanistan to Afghanistan. Which Afghanistan? The, the, the first Afghanistan is the second uh, you, um, un anglo afghan war, uh, which started a, more than 100 years before, uh, in 1878. And the second one is the current Maybe you have seen the evacuation of US forces, UK forces, from Kabul recently, <coughs> particularly in August. So uh, Afghanistan is a difficult place. But interestingly, Afghanistan, in some ways, connected to countries, Japan and the UK. So I will talk why Afghanistan actually created bond between the two countries, far away from the, the, the country, particularly maritime parts. Why Afghanistan at the middle, at the center of the Eurasian continent, could connect two countries, two maritime parts. So let me uh, start my talk. And this is a, after the crisis, th this is a picture of the Second Afghan War, after the crisis in Afghanistan in the end of the 19th century. One of today's my biggest problem is that I forget my glasses. So sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> because after three years, I, 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 I didn't do recently this kind of in-person lecture, so I forget what to do, but anyway, I can talk. And uh, first, I like to focus on the Second Afghan Anglo Afghan War of 1878 to 1890. And this is a kind of a typical example of uh, the great game between the UK and the Russia, Russian Empire, British Empire. Two empires are confronting to expand their strategic imperial interest at the center of Eurasian continent. And the center, the front line was Afghanistan to defend India it was important for the UK to secure Afghanistan from uh, external invasion. So UK wanted to create and try to use Afghanistan as a kind of a buffer zone or barrier to defend its imperial strategic interest in India. On the other hand, by expanding and stretching railways at that time, Russia was expanding its interests as well and the territories as well. In in, in, at the center of Eurasian continent. And then uh, we saw a crash between two empires. And in the beginning, of course, UK did it quite successfully by ascending, dispatching a uh, sufficient number of troops and weapons together with, of course, Indian troops. And then, of course, I, I know that uh, there are some people in this room who are f quite familiar with British history, much more than I do. But uh, let me uh, 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 place this story in a much broader context of international history. The point is that UK forces, likewise the recent, Anglo no, uh, recent uh, British experience in Afghanistan, in this period, UK forces uh, really confronted difficulties in maintaining its influence and interest there. So it was not so difficult for British forces to defeat the enemy. But the problem after was, after the war, it was quite costly and it was quite uh, uh, tiresome to maintain its strategic interest there. So that's why <coughs> the UK government decided to evacuate, evacuate from the region. And because of the overstretch of British Empire, it was more and more difficult for the UK to prepare sufficient numbers of troops, troops or vessels in faraway places. So little by little, because of the gathering of enemies or rivals, like a Russian Empire and the French Empire, and also Germany, Imperial Germany, was beginning to construct much stronger naval force after uh, the resignation of Otto von Bismarck. Chancellor Bismarck. So during that period, I mean, uh, 1890, the UK government began to think about creating an ally, particularly in the far right press, either China or the U or, or Japan. So this is a new situation where UK was beginning to think about the strategic part, the necessity of a strategic partner. And so this is a quite famous picture, maybe most of you familiar. So uh, the two empires, lion and bear, Russian Empire and uh, 
British Empire. And then some scholar like Anthony, Professor Anthony Best of London School of Economics wrote in his recent book, which I just uh, published this year, uh, entitled British Engagement with Japan 1854-1922, The Origins and Cause of an Unlikely Alliance. He wrote in his book that, I quote, the British estimate of Japan's overall strategic worth came into clearer focus in April 1885, when the outbreak of the uh, pending crisis on the Russian-Afghan border uh, thereafter uh, uh, threatened to lead to an Anglo-Russian war. The crisis led ministers to discuss whether Britain should enlist the support of China and Japan. Which one's better? Of course, uh, China was a big empire. And of course, many people in the UK knows about the power of China, but uh, it was a declining power. On the other hand, Japan was the first modernized country which learned so many things from the UK and uh, which was constructing a new navy, a Japanese navy, uh, with British vessels. So uh, in the end, particularly after the Sino-Japanese War of 1894, UK government began to think that Japan could be used as an important tool to enhance and secure British strategic interests or imperial interests, particularly in the Far East. So this is a new situation which actually began in the Afghan war. Afghan war actually told, indicated the difficulty for the UK to maintain its strategic interest, important vital interest in the Far East area. So this began the new era uh, for the necessity of British ally. And, and so uh, we can put the, the second Anglo Afghan war in a much broader historical context. Then I like to point out the structural confrontation between sea power and land power. And of course, this uh, thesis, this argument was basically constructed by a famous uh, geographer, uh, Sir uh, Harold Halford Mackinder. Maybe his name is familiar to you because you learned geography <laughs> in Cambridge. Uh, and, uh, he uh, made a very important uh, framework of, uh, uh, of, of thought. And uh, international politics in the Eurasian continent in the last two centuries can be easily characterized or summarized as a structural confrontation between land of power and the sea power. So at the time of the great game, of course, land of power was Russian empire and sea power was British empire. But nowadays, we can easily think that Land power is exemplified by China, or the combination of China and Russia. And sea power, of course, can be exemplified by the combination of the United States and Japan, UK. So if you look at the uh, carrier strike group 21, uh, which we saw in September recently in Japanese news media, Japanese news media deeply, widely cover the visit by uh, British modern navy, naval vessels to Japan. And I think that ambassador prepared really a lot to realize it. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful opportunity for Japanese people to realize the importance of British role in the area. But the British role in, in, in the area, I mean, the, in the Pacific or, or, or the Pacific uh, uh, Ocean is not new. It has a much longer tradition and history, as I explained, as a SIPA which try to control the world. So uh, if we look at the structural confrontation between sea power and land power, we can easily notice the importance of she was carrier strike group 21 visit to Asia or to Japan. Because uh, now sea powers uh, align and uh, trying to uh, integrate forces to be stronger against China because uh, Quite oddly enough, now in many, many uh, uh, a kind of a military uh, a simulation, always, both in China and the US, United States as well, when they do it, I mean, <coughs> kind of a military simulation on computer, always China wins. Always the United States will lose a game. So because of this reality, because of the much bigger size of Chinese 
forces. Previously, if we combine, I mean, the Japanese self-defense forces is combined with American forces in Japan, we could win against China. But now the situation is totally different. China can easily defeat, you, you defeat US forces in uh, Japan because uh, it takes several weeks, if not months, to gather sufficient numbers of vessels and forces for the United States to try to uh, uh, balance expanding Chinese uh, power in the region. China is there, Chinese forces is there, but the United States forces actually uh, scatter around all over the world. It takes time, it weeks or month. So in the sense, China uh, uh, can easily do a kind of a blitzkrieg, quite a rapid invasion against Taiwan or any other island. So that's why nowadays many people now talk about uh, Chinese invasion to Taiwan. So in this moment, it is more necessary than before for these maritime powers, I mean United States, UK, Japan, Australia, to gather to present its strength to China, to try to maintain the stability in the region. So this has a long tradition, as I explained before. Of course, uh, Japan is far away from the UK, mainland. And uh, the situation, geographical situation, has remained the same. So uh, to maintain British role, if UK is not abandoning its role in the region, in the Pacific or in the Pacific Ocean, UK needs friends, strategic partners, to uh, multiply its influence in the region. And more than 100 years before, in 1902, UK chose Japan. Once again, UK chose Japan as an important strategic partner. Of course, United States, Australia are likewise. So uh, it is uh, written by a uh, famous historian, Jeremy Brack, uh, in his book, Geopolitics. Uh, he wrote, uh, Professor Jeremy Brock, Jeremy uh, Black wrote that, I quote, Mackinder told his audience in 1904 that Shipa was coming to an end as a result of the reassertion of land power made possible by the railway. Alongside the technology of transport came the importance of that of communications, notably telegraphy and the onset of radio. These technologies were important to military command and control, as well as to imperial governance and to economic activity, especially maritime trade. If you uh, put the recent moves in China, you can easily see the analogy of that. Mm. 5G technologies, high-speed internet connection technologies, is widely occupied, dominated by China, far as you are familiar with. UK government, until recently, decided to introduce, of course, 35% of that, introduce Chinese power system in Britain. But last July, UK government suddenly changed its attitudes. I don't know what role you play, maybe important role, but uh, it is important to enhance cooperation among democracies, trustworthy partners. But that's why, even though it's cheap, and it's more convenient to introduce Chinese system. But the Chinese technologies can e be easily used as a weapon <coughs> to dominate the region, as Russia did more than 100 years before. So this, I mean, these technologies were linked with military command and control. And of course, China was now controlling important ports. And to, 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 to dominate some of the sea communication, so she communication and the telecommunications are two important tools for both Russian Empire and the contemporary China to dominate the region. So technology matters. So in the sense, uh, UK, Japan, and United States need more cooperation to, uh, 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 to, to create a new supply chain or new kind of, of technology cooperation among the democracies. And this is a map, famous map uh, used by uh, Professor uh, Mackinder more than a <coughs> century before. Uh, in his article, a Geographical Pivot to his, he pivot of History in the Geographical Journal, 1904 <coughs> April. It was a turning point in British foreign policy by uh, creating 
on top of Korea, cordial with France. And Britain uh, was in need of strategic partners. That was UK, uh, uh, US, Japan, and France. UK created Entente Cordiale, and UK created uh, Anglo-Japanese Alliance. And in addition to these, uh, UK also created Hague Ponsport Agreement in 1901 with the United States mm -hmm. by conceding some of the important interests, strategic interests, to the United States in Western Hemisphere. By doing it, I think that once again, United Kingdom, at that time, many people talked about the decline of the UK, of course. Uh, Pax Britannica was no more. Uh, it, was important, it, it was impossible for the UK at that time to maintain its uh, strategic advantage by maintaining two past standards of neighbor, uh, uh, neighbor power. I mean, if you want to know more about uh, those two past standards, maybe it's nice to attend uh, Professor Alicia Paterano's class in King's College London. Maybe he can shoot <laughs> everything about these kind of neighbor affairs not just in Asia Pacific, but much broader in a much broader sense. But anyway, uh, it was a turning point in history. I, I, I would like to emphasize that we are now experiencing the turning point in history again. Further, land of power, the co combination of Russia and China, can be at the center of international politics, like Shanghai uh, Cooperation uh, Organization, or whether, once again, UK, together with the United States, Australia, Japan, uh, can be in a driving seat in creating international or maintaining international order. In UK and Japan in global conflicts. I may be uh, better to skip some of these because it's easy. Cold War years, the structural conflict between the two sides, the ship power and the continental power, uh, could easily be exemplified the rivalry between Soviet Union as a land power and the United States as maritime power. Both UK and Japan were allied to the United States to try to maintain the balance in each region, I mean in Asia and in Europe. With these help, I mean support, I mean Japanese uh, military, self-defense forces, and British role in the Atlantic and Europe, the United States could maintain its supremacy in global politics. And in the end, of course, the West actually won the Cold War. And after the end of the Cold War, we experience a time of the American empire. That's why we thought that we could rely on American power, exceptional power as an empire. So that's why in both countries, Japan and the UK, there were discussions that we should reduce our military spending by asking the United States to play, play a larger role in stabilizing international relations. Because there are no en en enemy, so if there is no enemy, there is no necessity to spend a huge amount of money for defense. But it's not true. There is a global war on terror and the rapid rise of China. So having seen these new trends, the United States has been beginning to ask allies, like UK, Japan, and some other European allies, to spend more in defense. Now I think that the, the, the degree would become greater. I mean, the current Biden administration is pressuring Japan to spend more. So the current Japanese administration is talking about spending twice, I mean, the two percentage of Japanese GDP, because uh, this is a standard for the NATO allies. So uh, I think that uh, we need to have a radical uh, a change in our mindset about security. Otherwise, uh, I think that we, should, we will lose our advantage in influencing international relations. So I have to stop soon. UK Japan Security Corporation in the 21st century. So you now can have a basic background of why UK and the US have been keen on creating a much stronger tie uh, one another. Unlike before, UK and Japan could not, cannot stand by these in important international trends. And of course, unlike Japan, I think in the last two or three decades, UK has been expanding its influence and its activities, security activities all over <coughs> the world. I know that there are many criticisms within the UK to spend more in this kind of defense issues. So that's why, naturally, to reduce some of the burdens, to reduce some of the defense spending costs, 
it's natural for the UK to ask its strategic partners, like Australia, Japan, some other countries, to do more. And I think this is a basic understanding about AUKUS. Some of you might be familiar with the, the, the rise of AUKUS. AUKUS is, of course, Australia, UK, and the US. Cooperation, security cooperation among the three countries. Because it's necessary for the, both UK and the US to ask Australia to do more. And this, of course, result, will result in their strong request to Japan to do more. So I think by combining all of these efforts, Japan and the UK, US can be in an advantageous position in the region, in the, in the Pacific. And that's why it is important to have much stronger tie between the two countries. And then, well, uh, we, we have seen a Jap UK, Japan uh, joint declaration of security cooperation of uh, August 2017. I think one, this was one of the more important steps forward between the two countries to deepen its security cooperation. So we should now perhaps call it as ally, but uh, of course, uh, modern security partnership is different from previous one. But uh, at the same time, we can place this into a much broader historical framework, and it remains the same in the last 100 years or more to, to, by, by looking at the whole Eurasian continent. So maybe I should stop here. Maybe you, you can see many, many familiar pictures you have been heavily involved with. And uh, I simply admire both British diplomats and Japanese diplomats. Uh, as a scholar, I'm always saying that uh, Japanese diplomats British diplomats, French diplomats, these countries actually have the best diplomats. Of course, there are some others who have very important diplomats. Because both United States and China, they don't have to have a good diplomats because they are powerful enough. Their economic power and the military power <laughs> make it unnecessary to have, have, have a good diplomats. They can enjoy having a President Trump because they have sufficient amount of power both military power, economic power. But UK and Japan cannot enjoy this kind of luxury of uh, having uh, not so uh, suitable uh, political leaders or diplomats. And that's why it's really serious for Japan, France, and UK to have a good diplomat, like Ambassador Martin, of course, to, to try to secure our national interests. So in this sense, I think UK-Japan security cooperation is very important. And this is the end of my talk after the crisis in Afghanistan 2.0. Afghanistan 2.0 is a current crisis in Afghanistan. Of course, Afghanistan is far away from Japan, far away from the UK. So it would be natural for many in the UK and Japan to think about or to doubt why it is necessary for us to stabilize the region. It is important because it is a kind of a center of global conflict between Japan and land power. But we don't have to actually dispatch our defense forces there. We can do it otherwise. So there are many ways to strengthen that coalition. So uh, directly sending military troops there, I think, is not the only answer uh, to, to, to win the battle or confrontation or competition between the two sides. And of course, it's not fatal, and it's not always the same. I mean, there can be cooperation between land partnership, and there were some times when land partnership uh, could collaborate deeply. And I think that we can, well, after a while, see this kind of collaboration between the two sides, and I stop here. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you very much, Hosea Sensei, for that uh, wonderful presentation. And it was a reminder to me as a practicing diplomat of uh, what uh, academics bring to the piece by being able to draw on this deep sort of historical analysis and uh, uh, identify how some of the, the things that were relevant at the end of the 19th century are relevant today. And some of the things that you were talking about, um, the, 
uh, the land powers and sea powers, you know, all those names, Mahan and Mackinder and Speakman and so on coming at it, took me right back to my academic roots. And also some of the key messages that you drew around partnership and around technological developments and their influence on security relations <coughs> absolutely as relevant now as they, as they were in the, the time you were speaking about. Um, so as Jason said at the beginning, I just finished being ambassador in Japan in February this year, where I spent the last four years. And I was uh, lucky to uh, manage to visit all 47 Japanese prefectures during <laughs> that four years. Um, I never had the experience, though, that happened to one of my predecessors who was traveling around Japan in the 1970s. And he went to visit a provincial town in Japan. And as often happens when you do that, there was a, 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 a gathering to meet him at the station. The local mayor was there and a big banner across the platform saying, a very warm welcome to the ambassador of France. <laughs> uh, he, was a, he was a very nice man, like all British diplomats, and so he didn't want to upset anyone, so he decided he would, for the rest of the day, pretend to be the French ambassador. <laughs> so he wandered around speaking in a sort of pseudo-French accent, <laughs> but he couldn't resist every now and again throwing into the conversation lines about how, you know, even though I am French and my favorite country is, of course, the Grand Bretagne. <laughs> And he managed to avoid mentioning fisheries at all. <laughs> uh, and so I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with you as a sort of colleague today, because I have um, now started giving some lectures in international relations at your university, at Keio, as a visiting um, professor. And it's, it's made me realize how hard it is to be an academic and how much work you have to put in for every one hour lecture that you're, you're delivering. And sadly, I'm having to do it online rather than uh, being at Keio. Um, so I, I think. I'm sure many of us are hoping that travel between the UK and Japan will be restored before too long. So what I'm going to do is make a few comments on your remarks from my perspective and then perhaps ask you a few questions from me to you, things that have been sparked by what you said, and then we'll um, open it up for some questions from the audience. First of all, I really liked the way you used Afghanistan as a framing device because it brought together the two ends of that historic perspective. Um, and reference to Afghanistan always adds a sort of color and context to, to it. I, I'd make three points on Afghanistan, and I don't claim to be any sort of expert on Afghanistan, but um, first of all, I think the reasons that the UK joined the US-led alliance in Afghanistan this time round were primarily uh, about trying to avoid Afghanistan being used as a base and sanctuary for international terrorism. And I think that's a rather different context from the great game of the late 19th century. Um, second, I don't think we can really compare Japan's relatively small non-combatant role in Afghanistan this time with the uh, historic military success which Japan enjoyed during the uh, Russo-Japan War of 1904-05. Um, and thirdly, I think I would say that any potential adversaries of the Western Alliance who look at the slightly messy end game that we've just been through in Afghanistan, I think uh, they would be making a big mistake if they drew any um, meaning from that about how the West would behave to any situations that might arrive in Indo-Pacific. So some of the things I agree very strongly with you on are that we are seeing and have seen uh, a really significant strengthening of the UK's security relationship with Japan. And I've been very much involved with that over the last um, four years as ambassador in Tokyo. So in 2018, for example, we saw uh, the British Army doing joint exercises with the Japanese Self-Defense Forces for the first time ever. Um, and just before I got to uh, Tokyo, the Royal Air Force had visited with a squadron, squadron of uh, Typhoon fighter jets. But it's really in the maritime field that we've seen the biggest, um, most active developments. During my time in Japan, uh, we saw many uh, ships visits from the Royal Navy. I think they're always made very welcome because there's such a long tradition between uh, the British and Japanese navies that goes back to Japanese warships being built in British shipyards and Admiral Togo studying in the UK and so on. And when these Royal Navy ships came through Japan, they weren't just coming for show, they were actually going out with the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force on ex not just exercises but practical enforcement of UN sanctions on the DPRK, on North Korea. 
And of course, this all came to a culmination with the visit which you mentioned this year of the Queen Elizabeth and the Carrier Strike Group. And uh, I remember going down to visit the Queen Elizabeth in Portsmouth Harbour before she was actually commissioned while she was still on trials, but taking the then Japanese Defence Minister Onodera Sensei uh, on board. And I remember him saying at the time, I hope that she comes through Japan on her first trip. So I'm glad that we were able to deliver that. Um, and I think uh, what was also important about that carrier strike group was, and it gets back to your theme of partnerships, it was uh, a, a ship which had on board uh, a contingent of US jets. It had a Dutch ship in the convoy. And as it went through the world, it did exercises with various partner nations. So, so I think the, 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 the maritime collaboration is something which we really have been seeing growing. In fact, I used to find as I went around the country, Japanese would regularly come to me and say, are we seeing a renewal of the, the Nichi Edome, the, the Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1902? And when I saw successive uh, British Prime Ministers uh, meeting with their Japanese counterparts, there was a clear uh, common ground in their analysis uh, and also a genuine wish to work more closely together on the international security scene. And uh, you had a, a picture of um, Theresa May there with um, Prime Minister Abe. And actually, uh, Prime Minister Abe invited Theresa May to attend a meeting of Japan's <coughs> National Security Council. And that the National Security Council was an innovation that Abe had introduced. I think it was quite significantly based on the model that we had established in the UK for a National Security Council. So what is driving this uh, new enhanced cooperation between the UK and Japan, and the UK more actively uh, being in, in Indo-Pacific? Um, some people would say that post-Brexit, um, uh, global Britain is looking for a new role, looking for new partners. Um, I would prefer to put it the other way around, though, and say that post-Brexit, the UK doesn't have to spend so much time looking inwards at the EU and all our relationships, complex relationships with it. The UK is freer to pursue its global interests, whether those interests are in the security field, the economic field, or trade. And obviously, the integrated review of our um, Defence, Foreign, Security, Development Policy, which was published earlier this year, is the starting point for UK thinking on its future security posture. And one of the strong themes that emerged from that integrated review was what's become known as the Indo-Pacific tilt. And it brought back memories to me of when I was High Commissioner in Australia, because I remember being in the Australian Parliament back in 2011, when then President Obama announced the US's Asian pivot. Now, I could try to analyze the difference between a tilt and a pivot, but I don't want to end up sounding like a judge on Strictly. <laughs> but obviously, the driver for much of this is China. And the integrated review described China as a systemic competitor. And I think for all of us, whether it's in the UK, Japan, the US, we have to balance various factors in our relationship with China. First of all, the huge economic opportunities which China provides. And I was very involved uh, with Xi Jinping's state visit to the UK in 2015, which launched the so-called golden era. Secondly, we recognize the need to work with China on big global challenges like climate change, where if China is not part of the solution, then we're not going to have a solution. And I think you know, we're all watching events in Glasgow this week, and that's, that's becoming clear. And third, we see various uh, security, political challenges, which have been thrown up by Chinese behaviors, whether they're human rights abuses in Xinjiang, whether they're curtailment of democratic freedoms in Hong Kong, um, assertive behaviors in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, um, increasing belligerence directed at Taiwan, um, mask diplomacy during COVID, uh, and fears of um, domination of sensitive technology sectors. I think the US Secretary of State Blinken uh, summed it up quite well when he described China uh, back in March this year as competitor, collaborator, and adversary, combination of all of those. Another uh, key theme which came out of the integrated review was a slightly reduced focus on the rules-based international system, which had been a big central feature of UK foreign policy 
for some time, and a bigger alliance on um, a bigger emphasis on alliances and partnerships, which says that you mentioned very much in, in your presentation. And those alliances and partnerships based on values and on shared interests. And Japan is clearly very much part of that for the UK. Then in September, we saw the announcement of the new uh, AUKUS partnership, which you mentioned, between uh, the UK, Australia, and the US. And I've served in all of those three countries, so I'm glad that despite that, they're all still getting along very well. <laughs> Um, obviously, the key element of that collaboration is in uh, the field of submarines, um, where there will be a collaboration to help Australia develop a new generation of nuclear-powered submarines. And that's significant because it will significantly increase the range of Australia's submarines, the amount of time they can spend uh, on their voyages. And actually, Australia is so far from anywhere, it's a submarine base in Perth, it actually is several days steaming to even get to um, the South China Sea, for example. So extending its range is important. It also increases the stealthiness of those submarines. So it's really quite significant. But AUKUS wasn't just about submarines. It also talked about collaboration uh, in a whole range of other security-based technologies, cyber, um, artificial intelligence, quantum computing. So to sum up, I think we are now seeing a world with even more focus on the Indo-Pacific going forward and a world where we will be more actively pursuing partnerships and alliance building, whether it's in the security sphere like uh, AUKUS or whether it's in the economic sphere like the, uh, the CPTPP or as it's known for short, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnerships, <laughs> and strengthening the relationship between uh, Britain and Japan will be an important part of that for, for both countries. So those are my uh, introductory thoughts, and I'd like to turn now, sorry, Sensei, to, to ask you one or two questions before we open it up. Um, first question, I used to like reminding uh, visiting British ministers that Prime Minister Abe, in his two periods in office, had actually overlapped with five British Prime Ministers. <laughs> uh, I'm not particularly proud of that, because it's usually the other way around. <laughs> but Shinzo Abe had a huge influence over Japan's external posture, I think for two reasons. First, he had a very clear idea of what he thought Japan's security interests were, and a readiness to pursue them. And then secondly, a combination of his longevity and his charisma meant that he could actively take forward those interests, participating in international summits where he became an increasingly senior figure, and through his direct personal diplomacy with uh, a range of leaders from, from, from Trump to Putin. Now I suppose we can expect a lot of continuity under Kishida, who had, after all, been a foreign minister under Abe, and we assume that the influence of um, Abe will still be around behind the scenes. But I wonder, and, and you're someone who's advised various Jap Japanese governments, I wonder how you see Japanese um, foreign and security policy developing in the next period. And in particular, if we seem to be returning to a period where Japanese prime ministers are reshuffling every 18 months or two years. Right. May I? Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. And uh, one of my biggest expectation to come to this lecture today is to be able to listen to listen to your voice, your idea about the USK Japan Security Corporation. So that's why I'm really glad to be able to listen to, to your experiences and your view on that. And uh, and then uh, you ask me a question, important question about uh, Japanese political leadership and the future uh, trajectory of Japanese foreign policy. First of all, the recent result of the general election in Japan clearly indicates a new uh, standards for Japanese foreign policy, largely because of the, uh, the, 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 the defeat of a constitutional democratic party, particularly edano mm -hmm. uh, He's a quite charming politician, but he lost election. I mean, he couldn't uh, 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 win over the LDP in many ways. So uh, he, during the security legislation, I was a member of uh, Mr. Abe's security a legislation advisor panel, and uh, I was heavily criticized by them <laughs> because uh, of my uh, comment in newspaper or TV, and uh, they fiercely, not 
Edanosan himself, but uh, liberal wing fiercely criticized my role and my, my comments on the necessity of security legislation. I repeatedly <coughs> said to them that the, the reason why security legislation was necessary was that we need international cooperation. Without security co legislation, we actually cannot deepen our security cooperation with other like-minded countries. So that's why I'm really happy to see the development in the UK-Japan security cooperation based upon the new security legislation. And I think that Edano-san's uh, defeat in the most recent uh, general election, actually, w w is a kind of turning point in Japanese political history. Now, new standard is set. I mean, to, 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 to see the continuation of Abe's policy. And I am sometimes saying that Abe's role is similar to Yoshida Shigeru's role. Yoshida Shigeru created, after 1945, a new standard in Japanese foreign policy. And now Shinzo Abe created it. I think that there are only a few prime ministers who actually set these new standards. I would say Yoshida Shigeru, and Nakasone Yasuhiro, and also uh, Shinzo Abe. And uh, Junichu Koizumi was a uh, really popular and charismatic uh, political leader. But his focus was, as you know, focusing on uh, reform within Japan not the reform in its foreign policy. So in the sense, I think that the Shinzo Abe created a new standard in foreign policy, so it continues. Whoever uh, a new prime minister would be, this continues. But at the same time, uh, the other problem is that, uh, well, now we are seeing the spread of populism. Japan has been more or less immune from those spread of the populist, populist po politics. So populism easily results in an uh, inward-looking foreign policy. So I, I, I think that, in a sense, Japan has been a kind of uh, exceptional. In, in, in a way, it can concentrate in its role in, in constructing and maintaining liberal, liberal international order. So one of the biggest secrets, I think, of uh, the success, I would say, of Shinzo Abe's foreign policy is, first of all, of course, winning elections. Nearly every year, Japan has elections, big elections. And every year, Japanese prime minister must win these elections. It's extremely tough, unlike a British prime minister or American president, to win all these successive elections. So Abe is genius in winning elections. Suga couldn't do it. And I don't think that uh, Kishida can do it for five years or more. So in a sense, Abe is exceptional. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Abe has a clear vision in its foreign policy. Uh, no other prime ministers had such a strong interest in foreign and security <coughs> policy. So in a sense, Abe is exceptional. But of course, Kishida was foreign minister. He has a very sound idea about foreign policy, foreign and security policy. And besides, even though Kishida is not so charismatic, and popular among Japanese people. But he has really good stuff. He is supported by young, talented politicians, Japanese politicians. Mm. And some of them would become, I would sh I'm, I'm sure, some of them would become uh, future prime minister of Japan. And they have new thinking. And supported by the new, these new thinking, I think that the Kishida can do something quite new, even though his leadership might be quite soft and sometimes reactive. But uh, as a team, he can create a very strong team. But it depends on new Kanjicho, a secretary general of mm. LDP. Mm. If uh, 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 Motegi-san cannot, a uh, new secretary general, Kanjicho, can control the party. Mm. So the two people are essential, chief cabinet secretary and the Kanjicho and the uh, general secretary of uh, LDP. The, the strength, the secret of the strongest of Shinzo Abe was he had a very strong two leaders. I mean, Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, and also Kanjicho, Nikai, and before that, uh, 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 two, two, two predecessors. And anyway, I would just like to conclude that we need to think about the team. Abe couldn't create a good team in 2006. But based upon that lesson, have created a really strong team in 2012. Mm -hmm. And Japanese, the, the, the secret of the strength of prime minister, Japanese prime minister, largely depends on 
the nature of the tea. And I'm not quite sure whether Krishna is now creating a good tea. Maybe foreign security goes, goes to Hayashi-san. Hayashi-san is extremely, Yoshimata Hayashi is extremely rational. <coughs> and extre extremely rational politician in any country, democratic country, cannot survive longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> people are not quite rational enough to suppose those kind of rational leader. So I think he can become a very, he's fluent in English. He's a graduate of Harvard University. He's exceptionally smart. So he can be a very good foreign minister. But the point is, to what extent Kishida can maintain the current popularity. Thank you. Well, I think you and I are both far too rational to be politicians. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask one more question, then I'll open it up, because I think uh, I'm sure there are people burning to ask some questions. Uh, so we can imagine various potential flashpoints all around uh, the Indo-Pacific, um, which could happen, but I think the one that people most worry about is Taiwan. And we're seeing this year, we've seen increased belligerence from China, both in terms of the rhetoric, the language, but also in terms of um, greater incursions into airspace and so on. And I guess if the people of Taiwan are looking at what's happened in Hong Kong, the prospect of um, being resumed into, back into the, the, the mainland um, will not fill them with, with joy. So um, back in July this year, I think it was, the then Deputy Prime Minister Aso said that he could see a situation where um, if uh, Taiwan was attacked and the US joined in to defend it, that Japan would inevitably be drawn into that too. I wonder if you, and I think he was speaking rather beyond the official line of the Japanese government, as the official spokesman made clear later, but I wonder if you could say something about how you see scenarios around Taiwan playing out for Japan. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. Of course, this is the most important topic in the region nowadays. And uh, before I came to the UK, every week mm. I attended a kind of a meeting or discussion on the topic with Japanese colleagues, the best Taiwan experts in Japan and some of the best Taiwan experts in the United States on Zoom meeting or some other uh, by other uh, 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 ways, and uh, largely uh, we I see a kind of a consensus among the best Taiwan mm. experts that China is not quite willing to invade Taiwan directly, but China is quite willing to control Taiwan without fighting battle. So it's a Sun Tzu this Sun Tzu road to that. Uh, winning a battle is the second best. Mm -hmm. uh, winning a war without the battle is the best thing. So China is now doing a cyber war, really, really a terrible cyber war against Taiwan. This is one thing. The other thing is that now China, China is, Chinese government is trying to control some of the nationalist politicians in China, nationalist party politicians in, in Taiwan. So uh, some, some, some of the, them, I mean the politicians, are criticizing the current uh, government in being quite confrontational to China. So, uh, well, it's a kind of an all-out war without fighting. But in the beginning, I think that China would take some of the rocky islands. And uh, it's quite unlikely that the United States would uh, intervene in that kind of uh, military, uh, stealth military operation by China. So uh, in a decade or two, it is quite likely that the China will do something to control a part of Taiwan and maybe it takes a, a decade or two to totally control uh, a, a Taiwan by Chinese government. But uh, to register, I think that the United States is now really serious to try to create a strong security cooperation with Japan, UK, Australia, or other countries to register trend. If the register is really strong, I think that the Chinese leaders would have a second thought on that. And I think this is a current trend. Maybe the regist or deterrence is stronger than Chinese leaders were previously thought about. But on the other hand, uh, the, the downfall of Chinese economic growth is much more severe than we expected. Mm -hmm. And also the downfall of Chinese population, aging society is much more severe than we originally thought. So Xi Jinping is in a very difficult position. Now he's entering in, into his third term. But maybe in his third term, he could have no clear gain or fruit. So if Xi Jinping uh, cannot, will not be able to have any concrete fruits, maybe national unification will become the only possible goal for him. So he's much keener than before to try to unify Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So in the sense, we, can we should prepare for the both scenarios. 
it is quite unlikely that China will invade Taiwan. But on the other hand, China will do everything to dominate Taiwan without fighting. But uh, maybe with fighting after several years. So uh, maybe, uh, like uh, Philip Davidson, the commander of the American in the Pacific uh, command, uh, uh, force, uh, uh, mentioned in March this year, uh, uh, he, he, he mentioned that within six or seven years, maybe China would invade Taiwan. So we have to prepare for the time when China or Chinese leader would change its attitude on that. Thank you very much. That was very clear, but slightly worrying.